We have Jessica from El Dorado. Um, let's see who else we have. Uh, we, I see there's someone from the Transgendered Resource Center, one of our partners. Thanks for joining us. Um, Partnership for a Healthy Torrens Community. It's always so great to see these terrific organizations that we might not be so familiar with if we're not from that area, but there's so many people out there doing um, such great work. So check out the chat, see where everybody's from. Um, so with that, it looks like we're at time now that everybody's uh, coming into the room. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm sure you're already done hearing my voice. So I would, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Emily Kaltenbach, who is the Senior Director um, resident states and New Mexico for the Drug Policy Alliance. She is based here in New Mexico. Um, and it is my great pleasure to introduce her. Um, welcome, Emily. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Laura. Uh, greetings, New Mexico. Greetings, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Washington, New York, Texas. I mean, it's pretty amazing. I was looking at the registrations yesterday, and we have a range um, of localities represented um, all across the US. So thank you for all of you who joined us today. I'm really excited to kick off our Going Local event, which I believe might be the first in New Mexico and, and maybe elsewhere. Uh, I'm the state director of the Drug Policy Alliance's New Mexico office. I've been in this role for almost a decade. Um, and since we've opened an office, which actually has been about 20 years now, we've been working on issues such as overdose prevention, marijuana reform that's rooted in racial and social justice, and uh, various criminal justice reforms that really are shifting uh, the criminalization of drug use out of that criminal justice system and into a health-centered approach. So this half-day event will explore ways that we can work together uh, to, to support the health and well-being of our families here in New Mexico and other local jurisdictions around the country by taking action at a local level. But before I get started, I really would like to thank our fabulous event team. Kesselman Jones, Laura, Laura Kesselman, who you just heard from, really helped us make this virtual event a reality, assisting us in the transition from a small in-person event uh, into a creative virtual and, and safe space. So thank you, Laura. Thank you, Claudia, Susan, and Alicia, and all of the other room hosts who you'll uh, get to meet throughout the day. Thanks for all of your work. I want a, a big shout out to Michelle List, who's our consultant. I started working with Michelle last year during our project with the Santa Fe Municipal Drug Strategy Task Force. And she has helped me develop the concept for this event today and has provided really essential facilitation, project management, uh, and crucial ideas. Uh, so thank you, Michelle. And we are so proud to be co-hosting this event with an amazing group of organizations here in New Mexico, the Casa de Salud, Crossroads for Women, New Mexico Criminal Defense Lawyers Association, the New Mexico Law Offices of the Public Defender, New Mexico Voices for Children, the Living Group, and the Transgender Resource Center of New Mexico. Thank you for all the work you do. It's an honor to partner with these amazing organizations. And I really encourage all of you to go check out these organizations. There's a tab at the top of the event site and you can uh, click there and it'll take you to their web pages. We are really thankful for the financial support from the Opioid Hub. This is a project of the state's Behavioral Health Services Division. We couldn't have pulled off this event without their support. So thank you to the Hub. Uh, and finally, thank you to all the inspiring local and national speakers and moderators who will be offering up just innovative ideas, creativity, and vision today. Uh, I can't wait for these sessions to start. And I know it's a real bummer that we can't watch all of them uh, live, but I promise you they'll all be uploaded to the site and so you can come back and learn more uh, on your own time. We have been just overwhelmed uh, at the entrance interest of this event. I think this morning I looked and we had over 380 people registered. That's incredible. We started this uh, thinking it was just gonna be this small little uh, event and now it's just blossomed into this uh, huge online 
Um, we are going to take a moment and get a sense of who's in the room. So I'm going to pull up real quick just two surveys uh, that you can briefly take. They're little polls, Zoom polls. One of them is about what region in New Mexico you're from and whether you're from out of state. And the other one is going to be about your affiliation. So I'm going to just pause for a minute uh, and let folks answer that question, and then we'll get to see the data real time. waiting for a few more pe people to vote. And here are the results. Great, I'm gonna get off mute here. So um, we have, look at this, we have representation from every quadrant of the state, including Metro, uh, for those of you who are not in New Mexico, New Mexico is a very diverse geographically. Uh, we're a huge state. And so I'm really excited to see that we have participation um, from all over. I, I even saw that we had participation from Catron County. Again, for those of you who are not um, in New Mexico, Catron County, I think is still considered a frontier area in our country. It's way out there, um, but doing there's amazing work there. Um, I actually used to uh, work with the Community Health Center in Catron County. So thank you all for joining from all parts of the state. So then we're gonna quickly go and there's gonna be a new poll about affiliation. All right, Claudia, do we have our responses? Excellent. Uh, so again, you can see that we have representation from uh, our community advocates, uh, community members, county employees, elected officials, health professionals, people with lived experience. We have a lot of school employees and state employees. So thank you all for joining again. Part of what we're gonna uplift today is that it takes all of us. It's a collaborative effort at a local level. Uh, so we're really excited to see the diversity in participants today. All right, and I see that there's still some um, coming in on the chat so you can also see who's, who's joined today. So again, having grown up, I grew up in a rural community here in New Mexico, and I know that many, if not most of us, uh, understand sort of firsthand the visceral pain of problematic drug and alcohol use, but also the extreme pain of watching our loved ones criminalized instead of offered the services and supports they want and need. Um, and I also know that our local communities are resilient, creative, tenacious, and at a local level, we have the opportunity to start beginning to repair the damage done by the decades long war on drugs and develop comprehensive and ultimately more successful responses that reflect the community. So today we're gonna to hear about some of those collaborations, successes and progress being made in New Mexico and the local communities across the nation. These ideas were designed at the local level and really reflect the unique character of a community and its people. And we, we often forget that most drug policies are enforced and carried out at a local level. So which has spurred many cities across the nation to move drug policy reforms forward with more urgency. And we'll hear about some of those local jurisdictions work. And also we know that over the past year, it's been unprecedented with um, the pandemic, with the uprisings around police brutality 
that oftentimes local communities have also moved some of those reforms forward at an urgent, uh, in an urgent manner. And we'll also hear some of those changes that have been made in recent months. Our agenda covers a wide range of topics from reducing the role of the criminal justice system in responding to drug use, to expanding harm reduction and treatment services to improving drug education for youth. But before we dive into these topics, uh, we have the great honor of hearing from an incredible leader in the drug policy reform movement. I'd like to introduce a visionary activist, leader, colleague, and Drug Policies Alliance's new executive director, Cassandra Frederic. I'm excited for New Mexico and all the other states represented here to get to know her and hear about her ideas on why going local is so important. I've been fortunate to work and learn from Cassandra in her various roles at Drug Policy Alliance over the last decade. During her 10 years at DPA, Cassandra has been an architect of innovative campaigns to expand the debate around the impacts of policing, the importance of legalizing marijuana with social and racial justice at the forefront, engaging municipalities and state legislatures in comprehensive harm reduction strategies, and the breadth and, uh, of the overdose crisis within our communities of color. She's mobilized cities to rethink their approach to the drug policy, from, to drug policy from the ground up and to have a more dynamic and um, important speaker on this issue. But most importantly, Cassandra has been a powerful advocate for working closely with people who have been directly impacted uh, by the war on drugs. So Cassandra, thank you so much for taking the time and for joining us this morning. Uh, you now have the screen. Um, thank you so much, um, Emily, who is one of my favorite colleagues at Drug Policy Alliance for inviting me um, to join this amazing event. Um, I also had the great privilege of visiting Albuquerque and Santa Fe a couple of times for the DPA staff retreats. Um, and so I'm really excited to be in front of so many people um, in this particular place. So as Emily said, my name is Cassandra. I am the new executive director at Drug Policy Alliance. Yesterday was three months um, in the chair. Uh, I started out at Drug Policy Alliance as a social work intern back in 2009. And I came into our New York policy office not really aware of the issues around drugs. I came in um, really clear that people were struggling with drug use. I come from New York City. Um, my parents are immigrants um, from the, uh, the Caribbean island of Haiti. And so our conversations about drugs squarely focused on personal choice and criminalization. And you know, you won't have a drug issue if you don't use drugs. And if you use drugs, you're gonna get punished because you made a bad choice. And so working at Drug Policy Alliance for the last 10 years has really expanded my scope and understanding about what it is we're actually doing and what it is we're actually working on. And so I'm so excited to be here today because I think that going local um, is exactly that. It's the amount of work that I've done with my family, my 78 year old father um, and 60 something year old mom. It is the work that I've been doing with my uh, friends and family, even in the way that we talk about the issues, the way that we see addiction, how my friends are navigating, supporting their families. Going local to me is really doing the work that we um, have to do in order to build the world that we want to live in. And so Emily asked me to really open up today to really talk about my vision for the drug policy reform movement um, and talk about why I think it's so incredibly crucial for you all to be here today talking about uh, these issues. And so as Emily noted, Drug Policy Alliance is a national organization. We have offices in different states in the country. We also have a federal office and then we have a small grants program where we fund different local groups on the ground working to end the drug war in their communities. We are a small but mighty crew. Uh, and we are at this inflection point. As multiple news outlets showed in November, 
even though we didn't know who the president was, we knew very resoundingly that voters across the country decided to remove criminalization as our response to drug use. We saw that in the five states that legalized cannabis. We saw that in, in even in places like Mississippi in the South where they regulated medical cannabis. We saw that in Oregon um, where our partner organization, our political organization, Drug Policy Action, worked with local groups on the ground to decriminalize all drug use and to take those um, resources from marijuana tax revenues to invest in a treatment system um, and, and recreate a treatment system. And I think that this for us in November, oftentimes people were like, wow, that's amazing. And I think for us at DPA and in our broader drug policy movement, election Tuesday was our report card. It was very clear that the 20 years of work that um, our movement around drug policy has done, it was it was our parent-teacher conference, right? Like voters were telling us, do they believe what we're saying? Are they willing to take the next step in moving past what we know into the unknown um, that is based in things that we do know? And so I think the biggest thing that I want to impose or to offer here is my vision. The vision that I have for this work and for all of us together is that we need to invest in ourselves and in our communities and in our leadership to build the world that our loved ones need to survive but also thrive. What COVID-19 has made really, really clear for us is that what we have now doesn't work. What we have now is not everything it could be and that the challenges that we have are outside the scope of our possibilities currently. And that has been really difficult. You know, we have spent so much time, so much effort in things that we have been good enough. It's good enough to be able to offer people access to treatment that takes them a few months to get into. It is good enough to get people into a drug court so they might not be in jail, but they can still be in a carceral system. It is good enough to get people access to AA and 12 step meetings. Um, it is good enough that some people, you know, might have to wait three months to get access to methadone or will never have access to buprenorphine. I think the moment that we're at that COVID has shown us is that the good enough is not enough. That our communities need way more than what we have and that they are only impeded by our ability to radically imagine what it is. And the thing about radical Im imagination is that some folks think that we have to think outside the box, right? We have been told like, we're, we're not thinking big enough. We're not thinking strong enough. We're not thinking intersectionally enough. But the thing that I would say is not, that's not the case. We're not asking the questions that we need to ask. And when we get the answers, we go around what people say. My work has been defined by my intimate relationship with Vocal New York, which is a drug user union in New York City. These are people who are currently using drugs. These are people who are formerly using drugs. These are people who are using drugs depending on what day it is. That organization works and builds leadership development with people who are in and out of drug use, in and out of treatment, in and out of housing, in and out of chronic illness, right? And they build a policy agenda that Drug Policy Alliance in New York follows very closely. So when we're running a campaign and their members are like, we don't, we don't think this is helpful, this is not gonna change our lives, we stop running that campaign. And then we work on the campaign that they want. And through that intimate conversation is the understanding and the, and the knowledge that the answer is in front of us. People need housing, they need access to healthcare, they need supports to parent, they need supports for family reunification, and they need them without strings attached. They need them when they ask for them, and they need them without stigma 
without surveillance, without criminalization. This seems really simple, but everything in our structure, everything in our process goes against that. So much of the things that people need, basic necessities are tied to strings that make it difficult for people to access. Now, do those, does the structure that works right now work for some people? Yes. Does it work for enough people? Absolutely not. And the thing that has pushed me in the way that I think about our work is that it's not that people need to change. It's that our systems and our responses need to change to people. Human behavior is complex. It is nuanced. It is not one size fits all. These are all cliches you know very well. And even though they are cliches, it's really hard for our processes and structures to, to, to keep these things in mind. And so when we have the conversation about what is the new world that we are building, that is the first question. Do we believe that we need a new world? Or do we believe the world that we have right now just needs a couple of tweaks? And what I would offer as a black woman in America is that the foundation is too porous for us to build upon. That we actually need to build a new way. And in order for us to build a new way, we cannot rely on the decision makers of old. It doesn't mean that they cannot be a part of the conversation. It just means that they can't have an oversized influence on what that conversation should be. They cannot set the agenda because when they set the agenda last time, our loved ones and our community members were unable to access the things that they needed to do well. And so this comes back to why I say we have to go local. This is not about coastal politics. This is not about the 1% making all the decisions. It's about places like Santa Fe, New Mexico, Albuquerque, Jacksonville, Mississippi, Ithaca, New York, um, making the conversations, dealing with the very real issues that they're seeing every single day. And how do we set the parameters, create the community agreements for people to have that conversation? What does that actually look like? It looks like science being front and foremost in the way that we build our drug policies and our responses to them. So much of the things that we have that are predicated on the system right now are not based in data. They're not based in science. They're based in fear and feelings. Fear is a useful emotion, but it is debilitating and limiting in the way that we can imagine. It impedes the options that we allow ourselves to think about how we move forward. Human rights. I think one of the basic principles that we often miss is that people who use drugs are people first and that their drug use does not negate the fact that they are people in our lives. And we know that people who use drugs have harmed us, right? We think about family members that are really frustrating. We think about people that um, commit um, petty crimes or even big crimes. Hurt is real, harm is real. It does not strip people away from humanity, even if that person doesn't respect the humanity of others. And that is a big leap for our society, understanding that we cannot cancel people's humanity and dignity. And that if we are truly to go local and to build a foundation that we can actually flourish from, that we need science, human rights, racial justice, and public health to be leading the conversation as we build our community agreements about how we want to live in the world together. People who use drugs are people. And oftentimes we take on a paternalistic approach to think that they don't know what's best for them. When oftentimes the thing that people are navigating, especially when they are in the midst of chaotic drug use, is trauma. And they are coping with the options that they have and that we actually don't know what's best for them. But what we can offer is them 
more option to dealing with the things that they have. But that doesn't mean that we ignore community. And that doesn't mean we ignore family members of those people. I think oftentimes when our, our movement pushes forward issues of harm reduction, folks believe that we are prioritizing one community over the other. The benefit of going local is that we get to create a table that is representative of all the people and we weight people's opinions based on what the, what the question we're trying to answer. And that means things have to be people-centered and non-coercive. This table that we want to build has to be voluntary and it has to be non-coercive in its nature really shedding away from the issues of stigma and surveillance, thinking about the language that we're using when we're talking about people or we're looking at different interventions and understanding that we need to build a world where people can be met where they're at and they can get the things that they need when they say they need it. And in the last year of 2020, we know so many things are not set up in that way. And a lot of that has to do with the people that are decision makers spend more time arguing and measuring themselves against each other than they do listening to the indigenous communities in, in New Mexico. And the way forward to do that is for us to do it ourselves. We can't wait for the federal government or big decision makers to take our community seriously because we've already seen that they don't and that they haven't, and that they're more likely to show up when they need votes, as opposed to when we have to bury one of our loved ones. And so that means that the models we have to create, that we are the change we're looking for, all the cliches, as I've said before, but that we also know what our world needs. And we can't concede the decision-making to the people that created the world that we have right now. And so one of the things that we have seen is that this can happen. We've seen this in San Francisco where people have really changed the conversation. And some might think San Francisco is not in the best situation. They have an issue of homelessness. There's still a lot of drug use, but that's part of the reason is because we're not asking the right question around what it is that people need, housing. How do we get people housing? And how do we get people housing that they want? And how do we not create and erect barriers that impede people from getting those things? How do we push forward conversations that actually meet the need that people are saying, not the things that we already have in our mind? That's what's so exciting about going local is that you actually get to lay out the real questions and get rid of the bureaucracy that impedes us from actually getting to the vision that we all want. You all know the answers. And that the radical imagination that we are looking for is more like the radical questions that we need to answer. What is it that people need? And the emphasis needs to be on people, listening to what they say. We need a job, we need housing, we need food, we need support. Oftentimes people wonder why would a drug policy reformer even think about these issues? This is so outside of your scope. It brings me back to what Audre Lorde says. People don't live single issue lives. And the people that we're trying to work with and build with are not just dealing with drugs. They're dealing with so many other issues. And so it, it matters how we build the table when we go local. And because we can wrap our arms around cities way easier than we can wrap our arms around the country, you already know the people that do housing, that do healthcare, that do job, child welfare, that do job security, that do food security. Let's not create silos that don't need to be there. And let's actually build the responses that work for the people we want to work, to work with the people that we want to love and care for. And so I'm going, I'm looking at the time and I wanna make sure that y'all keep on this very action-packed schedule. And so the thing that I will keep you to is ask the radical questions. 
build upon the resources that you have here. Move away from the strategies that we know don't work. Criminalization, surveillance, stigma, all these things keep us from each other. Fear is a debilitating and limiting emotion. It can be helpful, it can be motivating, but it cannot lead our processes. We know all too well what the fear of others has left us with. A COVID-19 crisis that has decimated our communities with a raging overdose crisis in, in between it, with disproportionate police killings and violence, and with an economic gap that continues to rise and crush our communities. These issues are all a part of drug policy. And if we want to build the world that our loved ones need to survive and thrive, they are crucial questions as to how we build the table that we move forward to take care of our own. We have to do it together and we have to do it our own ways. But what's important is that we build policies and principles across this country that remind the people that we love them, that affirm the dignity and humanity of people, and that gets us to the brave new world that our communities deserve. Thank you. Sandra. Thank you. I wish we could hear the resounding applause. It's so strange being on virtual, <laughs> but um, I see like we're, we're lighting up here in the chat. Um, I really appreciate you setting the stage for today because everything you hit on um, is completely aligned with some of the, the topics, housing, reimagining what treatment looks like. I mean, I just wanna call out Paul Chavez who just said, you know, they grew clients, they're a substance use disorder and mental health treatment center. They grew clients by providing showers, storage of belonging, food, clothing, community. That is treatment. And that's what Cassandra is talking about. Cassandra, if you have five minutes to spare with us, um, I'd love it if a few folks, if you have questions, uh, I see there's, there are a bunch of standing ovations. So um, it's really exciting. Thank you. Um, and thank you for introducing your ideas to New Mexico. Um, I, I think we have a lot of work to do, but I am, I, again, I just want to reiterate that our communities are tenacious. Like our local communities are incredible. We do have a lot of those services. And to your point about, you know, we, we don't want to create silos. People say, well, we have no place to refer to divert people. We do because diverting is a mentorship program. Diverting is um, to right. uh, supportive housing and employment. And so if we can just work together and collaborate, we can get there. So um, there was one question that came in the Q&A and it's an issue that, that DPA has talked about a lot and that's about around drug courts. And I'm just, uh, could you share a little bit about DPA's um, position and some of the history um, with the drug court system? Yeah. So this is a question we get often, um, do drug courts work? And Drug Policy Alliance's position is that we do not think that people should have to be involved with the criminal legal system in order to get access to treatment. Drug courts were created because people understood that people needed better access to treatment. And that was the beginning inception of it. And I think for a while, you know, Drug Policy Alliance in the very early beginning kind of looked at it and said, you know, this is a step in the right direction because we wanted people to get access to treatment, right? We wanted people to get access to services. We wanted people to be not ripped from their communities and have a different kind of chance. And, you know, in the mid 2000s, we did some reports and looked at the research. And what we found is that drug courts were often manifesting some of the same things that we were seeing in the criminal legal system. So we were seeing who was getting access to treatment and who was being sanctioned. We were seeing who was being even given the option of getting drug treatment and who was not. And those were falling on racial lines. We were seeing people that had really low misdemeanor offenses being mired in a criminal legal system where if they had a short stint based on the original charge, they would have been done with. 
We saw people that were being into being pushed into a drug drug court system that didn't actually need access to treatment, right? And then they were taking treatment access and beds from people who actually needed them. And so one of the things that we have consist that we have come to is understanding that in order for us to build the world that our communities need, we need to disrupt and and take apart the relationship between help and the carceral system. And so we do not believe drug courts are the answer. We understand that for some people in the process of moving towards getting, um, moving from a criminal justice approach to a public health approach, that folks might want to go to drug courts. Um, what we would offer is that in 2020, there are way more options that are available than what started in the 1980s. And that you should really crucially think about what, what is it that you are trying to get in building a drug court system? And can you get it in a different way? Um, and, that's, and that's why I come back to the radical questions, which is what is the thing that you, what are the thing that you need to figure out? What is the question you want to answer? Um, because if it's about getting people access to treatment, if it's about getting people access to their families, if it's about slowing things down for people, are there other services that we can bulk up to get people to that same place without having them go through the criminal legal system. Thanks, Cassandra. Um, there are two other questions that came in and then I think what we'll do is let you go at night at our time 945 because I know that uh, you have a tight schedule as well. Um, but there are two really important questions that came up. Um, Emily Pollum asks, um, how does DPA research which changes will work in rural communities and how to implement those? And I uh, thank you, Emily, for bringing this up because um, you know, oftentimes these urban centric models um, don't apply to some of our rural areas. We're going to talk a little bit about that um, in one of, you know, if you're interested in that, go to the supervised consumption services panel that we're having, because I think a lot of that conversation is going to happen there. But yeah, Cassandra, could you talk a little bit about the urban rural divide when it comes to drug policy? Yeah. And so, as I said before, I work at, um, in the New York office for DPA for 10 years. And most people, when they think about New York, they think about New York City. And New York is way bigger than that. And so a few years ago, we had a conference on rural strategies in New York. And part of that was because, you know, we're having conversations like syringe exchanges and methadone and buprenorphine and saying, listen, you know, let's just add buprenorphine and methadone to these hospitals. And in parts of New York, all the hospitals are closing. And so we are having situations where people don't have a centralized place to get medical care. They don't have this, they don't, they're not traveling like 10 minutes in order to get access to something that they need. And so we've been building the leadership of rural, rural community members to build um, multiple town strategies that actually figure out how can we leverage different resources and what does telehealth actually look like. So an organization we've worked with quite a bit is called Next Distro. And Next Distro works throughout the country um, in rural communities to get access to syringes as well as naloxone um, because a lot of people need to create different kinds of stashes. Um, that's probably not the best word when talking about drug policy, but different kind of like stockpiles <laughs> um, for different resources for people that are living in communities that are hard to get to and that don't have like a centralized area of services. And so DPA recognizes that so much of our work can fit in an urban context. And it's why we're funding more local rural groups to really uh, disrupt the overrepresentation of urban contexts in the way that we navigate it. And the overdose crisis has really made this really clear for us because navigating overdose in a rural context is very different than in an urban context just because of spatiality and geography and resources and density. Um, and so that is an area that we've been building. And Emily, because she leads our New Mexico work is one of the biggest advocates in our like innovation in the way that we talk about these issues in different geographical spaces. Um, Emily, I'm seeing this last question around yeah. Oregon. Yeah, exactly. And thanks uh, because, and I just wanna note on this, uh, please join the criminal justice panel if you wanna learn more about Oregon because we'll be talking about that. But yeah, we're excited with Oregon. 
Yeah. Um, so the question was in Oregon, when more treatment centers are set up, will people be forced to go into these treatment centers? And is there any idea for what these costs are going to look like? And so the biggest thing that I will say is that we do not force people to get into treatment. The biggest thing about Oregon was not just removing the criminalization, but re removing the coercion from access to treatment. All treatment centers will be voluntary um, through Measure 110. Our biggest thing was making sure that people would have access to treatment and that treatment wasn't only traditional treatment, that treatment was also housing, that treatment was also harm reduction, that treatment was also job um, security, I mean, job training or job placement. Um, and so the key element of the treatment provisions of the Oregon initiative was that, that treatment would be non-coercive and voluntary. And we believe this to be true because we want to remove criminalization and punishment from care. Those things should not be together. Um, I'm a social worker, and oftentimes, especially in the drug policy space, we hear the rhetoric of tough love. Um, and as a social worker that's done work in drug policy and done work in domestic violence, um, I take the, 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 the lead from domestic violence folks that say love is not supposed to hurt, and love shouldn't hurt. And so that's um, the tr drug treatment will not be, no one will be forced into treatment. People will always have choices. Um, to the point about how much will it cost? So we will be expanding treatment access um, in Oregon. Uh, Oregon is um, near last when it comes to access to treatment in the country. So it's like 49.50, I think every year it rotates. Um, and so that money will be coming from uh, marijuana tax revenue, as well as diverted law enforcement um, resources. And it's the hope is that this money would be upwards of 100 to $150 million um, and will be expanding to 16 addiction recovery centers um, in parts in like really hard to reach parts. So not just in Portland or the urban areas, but in places that don't have any access at all, like um, in rural communities. And so that's another thing that we're really excited about and goes back to the question around rural innovation. All right, Cassandra, thank you. Uh, incredibly inspiring. I just wanna shout out that people have been putting in the chat um, how inspirational this morning has been. Um, how lucky the drug policy reform movement is um, to have your voice and your leadership and your vision. So thank you for what you shared today. Um, I, I'm excited uh, that you had a chance that we could introduce you to New Mexico. And I know there are gonna be lots of other opportunities. Um, I can't wait for post pandemic so that we can uh, all be in one space together um, and uplift um, these ideas and the ideas that came out of the event today. So. Uh, another round of applause. Thank you, Cassandra. And um, we'll follow up about, or we'll circle back around with you on questions that might come up. Awesome. Thank you so much. Have an amazing day and truly, truly very exciting. So much can happen when we work at the local level and we actually do for ourselves. Okay. Bye. Have a good day, Cassandra. Bye-bye. Um, so let's, um, I'm excited. We can, uh, today let's go ask the questions uh, that we need to ask, as Cassandra put it. I'm going to pass it on to, to Laura to do a little housekeeping uh, before we break and go into our individual sessions. Thank you, Emily. Wow, what a great way to start the morning. I think that, um, uh, if you're not excited about the rest of the day, I, I don't know what we can do, because that that was a a terrific thought. Um, I have written down a couple things that I think if you're not on social media, it could be a good time to start. But, um, you know, people don't live single issue lives. And I think um, uh, all of us here actually know that because I know a lot of you out there. So, um, you know, what a great message. So, we have a lot to do today. Um, we do have a little break. We wanna let you go ahead and refill and retop those beverages. Um, what I'd like to do right now, um, 
I'd like to show a housekeeping video. I know some of you might have seen it in the orientation, but if you haven't, it just provides you with some of the technical and logistical information that you need. And then I'm just going to go over the agenda really quickly, um, just so you know what's up for the rest of the day. Um, also, I want to remind people only because I've been watching the chat. There are two options when you chat. One is just to the panelists and one is the panelists and all participants. I've seen cr some great comments out there that just went to the panelists. So make sure that you select panelists and attendees so everybody can see your thoughts. So with that, hey, Claudia, can we queue up the, uh, the video and uh, take a gander? Welcome to today's special virtual presentation, Going Local, Drug Policy Reform in New Mexico. We thank you for joining us. Today's presentation is brought to you by the New Mexico Drug Policy Alliance, along with our co-hosts, Casa de Salud, Crossroads for Women, the New Mexico Criminal Defense Lawyers Association, the New Mexico Law Offices of the Public Defender, the New Mexico Opioid Hub, New Mexico Voices for Children, The Leaving Group, and the Transgender Resource Center of New Mexico. Today's sessions are being delivered on the Zoom webinar platform, which does not display attendee video. You will only be able to see presenters and their presentations on the screen. We encourage you to use the chat feature throughout this program to share your thoughts or ideas with fellow participants. We invite you to help us create a safe and positive experience for everyone by providing a harassment-free and inclusive environment where everyone feels welcome to participate. We reserve the right to remove attendees from the meeting who are displaying inappropriate behavior. Use the Q&A feature to direct questions to the panelists. Click Q&A, type your question, and click Send. Questions can be anonymous if you select that option. Presenters will be monitoring and responding as they are able. If your question has already been posted or you see a question you would like moved up in the queue, tap the thumbs up button. We will be polling attendees throughout the event and responses are anonymous. If you are participating on a mobile device or tablet, you will need to allow pop-ups to participate in the polls. If you need technical assistance, we offer live support via chat, email, or phone. For the best experience, close any programs on your computer that you are not using and find the location with the strongest internet signal. A link to an evaluation will be provided to you in the chat and via email following the event. We greatly appreciate your feedback. Sessions are being recorded and will be made available online along with any handouts if provided by the presenters. The library will be available on the same platform you are viewing these presentations within the next two weeks. Don't forget to share on social media using these hashtags. And finally, we encourage you to visit drugpolicy.org to learn more about our organization, upcoming events, and valuable resources. Thank you again for participating. And now, back to our host. Okay, so well, if you have any questions about um, the video or any of the technical things, feel free to uh, ask them in chat and we'll share the responses with everyone. Um, Reminder, because people will ask, again, yes, we are recording everything. You have to give us a little time to edit them, and then we'll get them back up onto the same platform. So you will have the opportunity to watch the other breakout sessions that you were unable to participate in. Um, so with that, um, this is the schedule. This is what's coming up. Uh, next is the breakout sessions. You may choose one. Um, if you do want to move from session to session, you may come and go as you please. You do have to return back to that Hey Summit platform to enter the session. So here are the, the next upcoming presentations at 1010. There will be a break and then we have another, another set of breakouts. There is only three at this time at 1120. You'll be able to pick from these. Um, and then there will be a closing session. 
um, which is on the next slide, please. Um, at 12.30, um, it will wrap up and uh, Emily will come back and give you some additional resources, things to think about. So we do encourage you to, to participate that, to sort of close close the deal, so to speak. Um, we also will be um, providing a link to an evaluation as well as sending that to you uh, via email. So you can either do it right then and there or do it later. Um, we highly encourage you to do that. Uh, we want your feedback. We want to know what you liked, what you didn't. Um, and uh, so we can take that information and continue uh, creating some great programming for you. Uh, so with that, it's, uh, you got five, uh, well, no, you got a little bit of time before going into your next session. Um, uh, if, which is 10, 10, so it's at 10, 10. So right now there's 15 minutes. If there's any questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat. I'm watching the chat right now. Um, but we are delighted you're with us today. Um, again, you are welcome to attend all of the sessions. If you can't you can come back to the recordings, um, don't forget to uh, use that chat. There's some uh, great, uh, great thoughts, um, contact information people are posting. Um, you're welcome to do that if you would like. Um, and then the Q and A is, uh, will again be used also in the breakouts to direct questions to the panelists. It really helps us um, see them if they're, they're segregated from the chat. So if any questions, I'm gonna watch the chat for a little bit. If not, um, feel free, you can leave this room at any time and get ready to go to the next room. It will open up immediately before the session begins and you'll see that pop up. Um, again, Claudia said, next session begins in 10 minutes um, and then you're gonna to return to that Hayes Summit website. Um, if you are getting a lot of email message reminders and you want to um, uh, and, and you want to uh, stop them, you can actually tell the system. Uh, and it looks like there's some clarification. It's on housing first and not house first. Ah, must have been a typo in there. Apologize for that. Um, so again, our next sessions are on does harm reduction based drug education work for teens, reducing the role of uh, local criminal justice system in responding to drug use, supervised consumption services, saving lives and preventing disease, and enhancing community based harm reduction and treatment services in local communities throughout the New Mexico. Don't know how you're going to pick great sessions, but we're going to go ahead and leave this room so the team can get ready for the breakout sessions. We'll see you over there. Have a great rest of the day. We'll see you all in one big room at the end. So enjoy your morning and thanks again for joining us.